So, picking up what we have talked about Gandhi that how he consciously transformed his life into a unified one and expanded his consciousness to connect others not only those who were near him, but to far and sundry by writing letters and all and that remember that was not an electronic age. He could do it because he actually trained his mirror neurons. He was not aware of mirror neurons, mirror neurons are recent discovery. But he had like Buddha, like Christ, like Krishna, like lot of other great leaders and all who could uh, connect to people, Gandhi became a master of it. Because for him, the man was more important than the principle. I am just telling you as an example, I am not saying you all should transform and really become world leaders. If you want, you can. But look at the process, how he used empathy of putting oneself into the shoe of the other and that thousands of people vouched. Otherwise, rarely it happens that if a person dies, uh, the Indian ritual is that a person, Hindu ritual is that a, or even a Muslim ritual or that if person dies, the food is not cooked at home for 13 days in Hindus and I think for 40 days in, uh, in, in Muslims. 70, 80 percent of this country food was not cooked for 13 days. It is amazing because the whole country identified with him. It cannot happen unless people think that this person is mine and whoever met him always thought this was the transformation of empathy which he had done. For him truth was an experience and not a creed. True empathy is the source of ahimsa and ahimsa was his creed we all know. Minimizing ego and desires harmonizing within prevents external conflict. You do not bother about minimizing ego and desires, we live in a different time set, we can do it, this still remains the best way. But as I say that we may be standing at minus 15, Gandhi may be standing at 80 on a linear scale. So, the path is correct, whether we move on to it to whatever point of achievement is a different ball game altogether. But harmonizing within, that was a basic need when I, if you remember resource activation, harmonizing within, harmonizing between the various contradictory. If you harmonize within, the external conflicts reduce. That is what he realized. Reconciliation, now this is important. When we are talking about uh, that if the empathy, violence, altruism, sacrifice, lust, greed, uh, everything is available to everybody, then obviously this process of knowing right and wrong is also available to everybody. They could, they cannot be 10 processes. So, Gandhi used to mention this something called a small inner voice. I think we all have it because obviously he was a man like us and there have been people like him before Christ and Buddha and Prophet Muhammad who actually um, have practiced all this. Sometimes you read the biographies and somewhere along the midline if you once you go deeper than their life situations and all you will start feeling there is a lot of commonality into the whole thing. And in fact, all religions in if you leave the ritualistic part of religion, most of the religion like Sufism or Buddhism or Zen Buddhism or Vedanta or Upanishad they actually boil down to this whole connectivity, the oneness of the thing which exists from mind to the universe. It may sound like bringing in religious philosophy, but there are few cosmologists and few people who are working in consciousness who, who actually think there may be universe may be a big giant brain and we are just small spikes of manifestation, especially if you uh, believe in the theory of multiple verses, multiple universes, which is a possibility with the, with the, with the quantum theory. The brain also has multiple potentials like uh, and creating multiple stories at that. At, so, the, even when if you have read quantum physics, you will know that 
the amount of probabilities which uh, uh, are there with the observer with the observer an act of measurement you materialize it into a single trajectory but where does rest rest of the potentialities go they say rest of the potentialities may exist in multiple universes the brain the unconscious mind has multiple options at a given point of time as we have talked about that why why do i suddenly pick up to demonstrate this and why not this maybe as i said previously it may be it is my thirst which is pushing me to just suddenly pick this up and tell okay fine this is i have decided and i have had water in the process so the given this so where do the potentialities go the lot of potentialities and alternative stories which emerge in dreams so the the will or intent maybe this is the inner voice which tells you what is right and wrong so maybe there is a possibility that transformation requires tweaking with this little inner voice so i will end it this and just continue to tell you take one behavior of one aspect of gandhi's life and then demonstrate to you how are we a violent species you we all know this man hitler we have heard of chengiz khan we have heard of invaders who used to come and uh, kill ruthlessly chengiz khan had the largest empire he was he opened up those days it was a very restricted trade between kingdoms but once chengiz khan demolished everything and made into huge empire the trade opened there was a positivity to it but he was ruthless this man hitler frustrated painter but uh, he took germany to great heights initially but then something went wrong and his evil came out and it is very interesting in history at the same time mahatma gandhi was practicing non violence in india and hitler was practicing extreme violence in germany at the same time it is coincidence or it is socio politics or it is the forces of the world which almost brought this whole thing into the front we really don't know but the big question is are we a violent species because man initially was a hunter and in the hunting he had to kill for food like other animal skill so in the process they had to once they started uniting as a community they started having violence against each other and with the communication and with the mirror neuroning they went together and they killed dinosaurs they almost destroyed flora and fauna it's not a very charitable history of homo sapiens but uh, still we have survived through through violence largely it is very unlikely this answers the initial question which i asked in the first opening opening lecture is that why do people suddenly become violent when their goals are not fulfilled when they are not able to achieve the first reaction is unless you are dealing with a very powerful enemy most of us will react violently this again comes into that half a minute of expression of Uh, when when your your thing are not getting satisfied and you are getting a feedback loop of regular failure or frustration the amygdala gets activated so either it pushes into fear or anxiety or anger most of us people get angry so that amount of verbal or non verbal violence is almost inherent to us and at the same time you can see this this picture is in in delhi police headquarters somebody has done this mural but at the same time during development as we have talked man was also living together they were not killing their wife they are not killing their uh, clan and all so simultaneously like in this period of history hitler and gandhi were doing two different experiments nature also in evolution was doing two experiments one violence to gain power for food for survival for security and to make uh, uh, and on the other hand sacrificing altruism charity maternal bonding the hormones also developed like this like oxytocin a hormone which is there in the amniotic fluid uh, which almost transmits the mother's warmth to the child uh, is uh, very well known to create a feeling of camaraderie and love and all so 
I think somebody is already making a nasal spray of it. So, you want to decrease violence, puff and you are all lovable and loving and everything else. So, dynamics of violence and its potential eruption versus the attachment altruistic sacrifice spectrum. But it is not very, very linear relationship. The V and me, the V means the me is self, V is my clan and the people whom I am love and related to versus others as lot of shades. It is a very, very non-linear process and it is very difficult to really correlate. But these are two dimensions which work on larger basis. Although Steve Pinker has written a book that the violence is decreasing, but uh, it may be decreasing on the borders. Even that does not seem to me, it may be just a phase because wars have predominated over history. So, is that violence which is uh, decreasing at the borders is getting within the country and within the self. So, it is an act, but you cannot handle violence, you cannot handle anger. If your brain starts dysfunctioning and it shrinks and it has no power to hold on, then it is a different issue. But taking no violence as an example of how to transform violence, it is an extreme act of conscious mind with a will and desire to control violence and it requires a huge integration of emotion and reason. So, cognitive self versus emotional self have to corroborate because as long as it is peaceful, there is no violence and then you think you are peaceful. But if anger comes, which is a natural primary, so what does the cognition do? It fights to suppress. If you suppress it more, next time it comes, it will come more because the brain cells amygdala has to express it. So, what do you do? Your non-violent thoughts have to enter into some dynamics with anger and channelize it into sublimation, love and this is where Gandhi steps in. I told you about his transformative conscious process, I am just giving this an example, there are many more examples. Mirror neurons to Gandhi neurons, probably Gandhi had a high super ego and his frontal cortex as I said was controlling the limbic system and he kept the frame of other in the self. When he was thinking about self and the need to express, he kept the other in mind. And how his expression will affect the other. This is in other words called empathy. So, when I express even before expressing and that has to be a very, very fine training of mind, even before expressing I put myself into the shoe of the other and feel the impact of what the anger is going to cause to me. So, if I am getting angry at you, even before I get angry to you, I jump to the other side in mind and have a feeling of how this anger is going to affect my mind. It would be the same feeling, feeling bad and that moment I may still control my anger because only then I will understand. This is empathy actually, identifying with the emotions, separating and looking at the consequences. It may have been inbuilt in Gandhi. It may have been inbuilt in his frontal cortex, so, but frontal cortex we all know does not come up before. Uh, frontal cortex is there, I mean the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the areas which control judgment and insight and control and all do not come before 19, 20 years of age. So, obviously, Gandhi had already had transformative uh, uh, situations before that, we, we all know this. 
So, had he already started training with training the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex grows and that is the center for will. So, will does have an existence. Uh, let me give you a brief uh, in next 10 15 minutes. 1893 Gandhi was a barrister slightly brash takes a first class ticket sets in uh, wanting to go to Johannesburg at St. Peter Maritzburg which is a station in South Africa his whole thing is thrown off. Gandhi whole night sat on the platform his blanket was also lying far but he did not have the courage he writes in this book called my experiments with truth you all, we all should read it actually once in a lifetime if nothing else at least chapter 9 to 13 which really give you the process of transformation chapter 9 to 13 when he was thrown out and he writes much later at 56 of years of age he, he says that I did not have the courage to go and ask for my blanket fearing humiliation but that night something changed he had a choice as I said to run away he had a choice to continue like the way he, but that night he himself wrote and the proof also in his future behavior is he chose to stay back and fight against this apartheid we know what apartheid was the discrimination on color and he said he is he will fight not only for himself but for the self respect of Indians which he knew at that time that they are not united that was one decision and the second was to fight it non-violently which he proved the next day. Next day in this uh, vehicle called Shirkam which is a carriage he was made to sit next to the, the driver the horseman because he was a he was an Indian and not a white person and even then another person wanted to smoke there. So, they wanted to push Gandhi out of there he was Gandhi was mercilessly beaten. And he wrote later that had I not been holding the, the, the pillar, I would have uh, hid back. But he suffered till the other white people um, objected and he was brought in. He went to a hotel during the same days and it was an American hotel. He was shifted to a room and he was asked to stay in the room because other people may not like uh, his presence there. All these humiliations were going in, but Gandhi was not reacting violently. He was taking this insults and this insults were transforming his need. The need was not to run away or to escape. The need was to transform and fight back in the process, but he knew he could have fought with violence, but he was not doing that. He was looking at fighting it non-violently and so, but he had not transformed in a day. Because if you remember what we were saying that transformation requires continuous hammering 24 into 7 tweaking extreme patience and also violence was there the lust was there he was fighting both he was like us all of us. So, in his relationship with Kasturba the parallel violence was getting expressed every time he writes that also you Gandhi was as I said nobody can blame him for dishonesty or like an open book telling everything to everybody. On one occasion he had allowed lot of people to his house, his house was becoming like one big house of a leader and uh, he was striving for simplicity, uh, a lot of tussle happening at home, Kasturba had her own personality, she was not one of those submissive wife. But like Gandhi's father taught him Ahimsa, Kasturba also taught him. On one occasion when Gandhi had asked uh, Kasturba to clean the latrine of the other person, Kasturba objected. So, Gandhi just caught her by hand and pulled her out of the house and then he suddenly realized what he is doing with extreme shame and guilt. This was another transformational point. So, see how many transformational points are coming in his life, extreme shame and guilt and probably that was one day after which Gandhi never became violent with her. So, ultimately his tweaking of the mind of not being violent slowly started giving a feedback to his unconscious mind and the unconscious mind slowly started eliminating its violent reactions. 
So the Gandhi we know was we know the Gandhi maybe after 40, 45 years of his age. Till that time he was practicing, and there are small incidents like uh, this is an incident which uh, one of his friends, Mili Polak, uh, wrote that one day they were walking on a street, and uh, Gandhi suddenly went to the other side, talked to a person, brought out something, and so Mili asked, "What was this?" He showed a knife, and she said, "Why?" what is happening? He said, this man had taken a vow to kill me. Now, where would he go finding me? I am here. I went to him, said, if you want to kill me, kill me. So, Mili asked, what did he give you? He said, a knife. It is an act of fearlessness. Do not think it is a joke, uh, because at those days, he could have killed him and nothing would have happened. This he repeated in Champaran in 1917. This is the 100th year of Champaran celebration, which is first Satyagraha against the indigo exploitation. He went there, the commissioner has said, I will kill this bastard if he comes, if I find him. The Gandhi at 4.30 got up and went there and tell the commissioner that after morning I become very busy, you will not be able to kill me, I am here, you kill me. And this is not what Gandhi has written, his secretary Mahadev Desai wrote this. This extreme act of, because th those were the Britishers days in India. And those are the whites, General Smuts was ruling. If the Gandhi would have been killed, nobody would have even bothered, no protest would have happened. But he was, this was his experimentation and courage to fail. But he had this whole insistence and this came from a deep philosophy which probably this is, what I am going to tell you is the real change of cognitive framework. He had this insistence with his clients that you have to tell me the absolute truth. And one of the clients said that, uh, he said, why did you do this crime? He said, no, no, to, to live. He said, living is not so important as to do wrong things. So, he had clearly made in his mind a cognitive framework where he said that this is beneficial for people, this is not. And once he decided that, then he kept tweaking his mind with his thought, which eventually changed his unconscious mind and the expression of the emotion. So, in his case, the cognition actually sublimated the emotion with a constant practice. This was a guy called Mir Alam who was on his side but fought uh, with Gandhi and he actually beat, beat up Gandhi mercilessly. Gandhi was beaten up mercilessly at many point of time in South Africa. He would have died actually. So, those who say Gandhi's Ahinsa was just a theory. Uh, I think they should probably reread history uh, because he had undergone this ahimsa and he had a, what he talked about non violence in later in life. He said, non violence is a job of a brave man. You should have the courage, you should have a first, you should have a ability to tolerate, second, you should not be a coward. It is better to be a violent person than be a coward. If somebody is attacking your house and you say, I, I, you cannot fight and then you say, I was a insub or a non-violent person, that is wrong. You should have fought tooth and nail. That is what he told women also. They should fight tooth and nail. Do not hide your cowardice under the, but non-violence is that I can do violence, but I will not do. That he kept practicing in his life and trained other people also. And this is what we know. Where did it come from? And he said that even, that is why he probably could not hate his enemies also. Because in this incident, he, all these incidents, people were known and Gandhi never filed a complaint against anybody in South Africa. Police arrested couple of people once. So, Gandhi went and got them released, saying that there is no complaint. And he told Mir Alam later on. Mir Alam was very repentant of hitting Gandhi. Gandhi said, when you were hitting me, my only concern was that I should not hate you. Now, this is a thought that I should not hate you. When I am being hit, obviously, a rage will come into me, which is natural. It has come in evolution. Gandhi was no different. But imagine, even within those two, three minutes, all this surges of violence which would be coming within him. We can explain this by neuroscience and we know that this is happening mind would be wanting to hit back, but this thought of I do not want to hit kept suppressing it. And this is how the unconscious actually got trained, because in later life he was 
known not to be angry or reaction. This is General Smuts who had incarcerated him and when uh, Gandhi was out of the jail, there is a famous scene in Attenborough's film which you all should see. Although it was about non-violence in a more political sense, less of transformational thing, but still it is a lesson. Gandhi had to do some work, so he made this slippers for him and presented it to his arch enemy. The general smarts returned this pair of slippers to Gandhi in his 70th birthday. He said, he said that I do not have the field which we can go into it. And general smarts warned the Britishers at that time that unless you deal with Mahatma Gandhi, all your schemes will fail because well, he has such a will to transform. So, 22 Chauri Chaura, we have already talked about how Gandhi took back uh, because of his conviction and belief and the Dandi march. So, Gandhi wanted to unite the country, wanted it to be non-violent. How he could do it? The other ways of transformation was in the details of life. It is very well known that Gandhi uh, in his ashram used to do all this homely activities, immersion total, cutting vegetables, nursing a sick person, playing with kids, all of us do it. But I guess if you read it more carefully, he had this a conscious part of him, one of the self which was observing the rest of the self, always trying to integrate as a whole. So, for him cleaning a toilet and cutting vegetables was as important as talking to Lord Irwin or to Jawaharlal Nehru about the politics. So, he could continue with daily activities and uh, talk about big things. Fasting, a tool which probably learned from his mother I guess, many times 21 days was nothing for him. Uh, whether it was a political coercion or, or violence or something is a matter of interpretation in, in different context. But just stopping at this, uh, you can read about Gandhi's stories, there is a whole website with India government has uh, really brought out. Uh, and that um, you can learn about more of his uh, stories. I will end at this basically with just one sentence that transformation is a conscious process, you can have model and you move on, decide and do. We will, uh, although there is an unconscious need and biology and social contacts, conditioning, but lot is there, but all ultimately work in a complex dynamics and being conscious of it really can help change life. Now, you would have listened to the lectures, you can read my experiments with truth, Gandhi as a model, other articles on mkgandhi.org. We will wrap up at this and uh, this brings to the end of lectures and uh, we will try to have a interactive session as you go through this, where we can talk about this further. So, I suggest you re listen, read and come back. Thank you very much. <laughs>